quarantine and stay at home orders. And she will also be providing some expertise on how to stay safe during the quarantine, including the safest way to visit the grocery store and um, should people be wearing masks in public and what kind of masks they should be wearing. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sexton um, here in a second, but please remember everyone's on mute. Um, as you have questions, please enter them into the chat function and Dr. Sexton and I will go through those questions um, at the conclusion of her um, presentation. Dr. Sexton. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Susan said, I'm Mary Beth Sexton. I'm one of the infectious disease physicians at Emory. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why it's so important that everybody isolate at home right now and how to stay safe while you're doing that. So I think that one of the things that's been very big in the media has been this idea about flattening the curve. And what that means is what we're finding and what people are finding across the country is that many of these patients with COVID-19 get better, including the people who are sick enough to be in the hospital or even the intensive care unit. But one of the reasons for that is that we have the staff and the equipment and the resources to devote to making those people better. And so it's critically important that we don't have a surge of patients all at the same time that overwhelms the healthcare system. And so that is why we are asking people to make sure that they shelter in place and isolate at home. For people who are doing that, I think this is the point at which the novelty of doing that has really started to wear off. And so we want to really thank the people who are staying at home so that healthcare workers can do their jobs and take care of the patients who do need to be in the hospital. And we really appreciate the efforts of the people who are doing that. So we wanna offer some tips about how to stay safe while you're isolating at home and what you should do if you do start to feel sick. So in terms of in Georgia, the order from the governor to shelter in place, what that means is they really do not want people to go out unless it's for things that are necessary, things like getting food or seeking medical care. So for people who are wondering when they should go out, the answer is as little as possible. And for things like groceries and medications and essentials, including the now incredibly popular toilet paper, the best thing that you can do is to get those items delivered, whether it's through a shipping service or a local delivery from a grocery store or pharmacy. That's the safest way to do this right now. People have asked questions about how do I know if that my delivery person doesn't have COVID-19? How do I know that this is safe? And from that perspective, what we are telling people is to use common sense and to be as careful as you possibly can, but to not be so overly concerned about things that are really unlikely. So you should use a delivery service. You should wash your hands after you handle packages or anything that comes. But the odds of somebody having sneezed directly on the box or the package that you're getting is vanishingly low. So that's not something that we would worry about from a safety perspective. If there are things that you have to go out for, something that you can't get delivered, there are still some ways to do that safely. One is to pick a time when a store isn't going to be as crowded. Because this idea of social distancing, of trying to stay at least six feet apart from other people, remains very important. The next thing is to use hand hygiene and what we call face hygiene. So to wash your hands before and after you enter a store, wipe down the handle of a grocery cart if they give you a disinfecting wipe to do that. Avoid touching your mouth, your nose, and your eyes at all costs. And then the final thing that has come up about when you do need to go out to get things is this idea of whether you should wear a mask. And CDC has issued new guidance on this that does suggest that people should wear cloth masks when they're out in public. This is a really important distinction. These are not medical masks, like surgical masks, procedure masks, or the N95s. The reason for that is that the settings we know those are most helpful are in healthcare. And there are supply chain issues nationally about being able to get access to those masks for healthcare workers who need them, and it's critically important that healthcare workers have access to those because our healthcare workers being healthy keeps everybody safe when they need to seek medical care. What the cloth masks do is if you're wearing one, it makes sure that you don't 
cough, sneeze, breathe, or speak out some of these infectious viral particles. So you wearing one keeps other people safe. And if everyone wears one, that protects you too. So this is a big community effort to keep everybody as safe as possible when we have to be out in public. If you're at home distancing from other people and you start to feel sick, one of the really important things to keep in mind is that more than 80% of people with COVID have a very mild illness and they never need medical attention. So if you're in that situation, the Emory team has put together a website, c19check.com, where you can put in some of your symptoms and get an opinion on how likely it is that those might be COVID and whether they're alarming to the point you need medical attention or whether you're probably okay to wait at home. And for most people, the safest thing to do is to not go out and to as much as possible, isolate yourself from anybody else who lives in your home with you. So that means if you can sleep in a separate bathroom or bedroom, do it. And if you have access to a separate bathroom, use it. If you don't, then trying to keep that six foot distance as much as possible, wiping down any surfaces that you touch, washing your hands frequently, and having everybody in the house avoid touching your face is really important. If you do develop symptoms that concern you, and this is gonna be things like chest pain, shortness of breath, or feeling confused, that's the time to seek medical attention. Absolutely appropriate to leave your house to do that. And if you go to an emergency department, just give them a heads up immediately that you think you might have COVID so that they can take precautions and keep you and all the healthcare workers and other patients safe. So at that point, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so it looks like there's one about cloth masks and what they do and don't do in terms of safety. So what we know from research is that it's really the medical grade masks that would catch most respiratory droplets coming at you the cloth masks, as we mentioned, are more to prevent you from exhaling out respiratory droplets at anyone else. And this is becoming more and more important the more we learn about how COVID is transmitted. It does appear that people are contagious in the couple days before they know they're sick. And so that can be true for people in the community. You may think you feel fine and you could be coming down with this and not know it. So you wearing a mask really protects all of the people around you. And then the way you get protection is if everybody else does this too. So as I mentioned, this is a team effort here. If everybody wears these cloth masks out in public, then nobody is exhaling these infected respiratory droplets and everybody is protected. Um, there's a question about whether or not this is airborne. And all of the data to date suggests that this is not truly airborne. But what is important to remember is that the respiratory droplets we're talking about are in the air. And for people who are speaking, singing, coughing, they can be in the air pretty forcefully. And so they can travel that six foot distance that we're talking about with social distancing and other people can breathe them in. The other thing we suspect happens is those droplets can contaminate surfaces to things like a counter in your house or a doorknob. And if somebody touches that and then touches their face, you can probably transmit the virus that way too. And the, there's questions about the degree to which you really can separate within a household. And I would agree that it's likely that everybody in a household gets this if somebody does, but it's not an absolute given. So this is the other reason we don't think this is truly airborne. For things like measles and chicken pox that are, usually more than 90% of the people living in a household get them. This has been more in the 10 to 50% range for people who are very close contacts of somebody who's positive. So the more you can isolate, the better. If you're somebody who's the sole caregiver for a small child, that's likely not possible. And so that's when you just consider if you can use a mask, if you can wash your hands as much as possible, have them wash their hands as much as possible. This is a great time to teach your kids to clean the house and to wash their hands and you do the best you can, and then beyond that, it's not something that you should stress about because you're doing everything you possibly can. Um, there are, there's a question about people wearing gloves in addition to the masks. 
that thus far has not been recommended for people outside of a healthcare setting. There's a couple reasons for that. One is that gloves seem to give people a false sense of security because their hands are protected. So they don't realize that they've then touched everything around them with those same gloves. So people end up contaminating sometimes a lot more surfaces wearing gloves than without them. The other reason is this is a respiratory virus. It's not something that moves through your skin. So if you get it on your hands, the best thing you can do is wash your hands or use hand sanitizer, and that should take care of the problem. So that's why that hasn't been widely recommended. Um, there's a question about going on walks in neighborhoods and parks. And I think that when you're outside, you're very much helped by all of the airflow. You're not in an enclosed space, but it's still really important to maintain that distance from people. So I, for example, will go out running, but I avoid areas like the Beltline in Atlanta that are jammed with people. And if I see somebody coming, I cross the street. You still wanna maintain those social distancing parameters as much as possible. Uh, there is a question about whether the testing site that's opening up today with rapid drive-through testing is going to be helpful. I think the answer to that is that it will help us get a better sense of how widespread the virus is in the community. It may help people who are mildly ill, who know they have this, to really emphasize that they should stay home. But nothing changes from the perspective of you need to be careful, you need to wash your hands, you need to not touch your face, you need to isolate yourself, people should not be out in public, and nothing about the test results per se will change that. It just may reinforce some of these behaviors. Um, there's another question about people who are younger appearing to be more impacted. I think what we're really seeing here is that this is a disease that is worse in people who have other medical conditions. And in some countries that has tended to be people who are much older, but we in the United States know that we have a relatively high proportion of people with heart disease and lung disease and diabetes who are younger than we might have seen in Italy, for example. And so that's why I think you're seeing people who are younger get impacted, is that this disease doesn't discriminate on the basis of age so much as what other medical problems you have that make you more likely to have complications. Another question about surface safety, this question of if you get packages or groceries or mail, should you wipe it down? And I think this is a case where, again, we want to be as careful as possible and use common sense, but not go overboard. And so I think what I would say is when I get groceries delivered, I take them out of the packaging that they were in and then I wash my hands before I put them away. If I get food delivered, I wash my hands before I eat. But I think the likelihood of transmitting COVID from a, somebody who was sick in a store or a sick delivery person, as long as you're not having face-to-face -face contact with them and you wash your hands, is very, very low. Um, there's a question, too, about this issue of the degree to which this is airborne and things like ventilation systems being a source of transmission. Thus far, although we're clearly continuing to learn more about this every day, there's no evidence that this is truly airborne. There are procedures you can do in a hospital, things like putting in a breathing tube, that may temporarily put the virus in the air more forcefully than you'd see. So we wear special protection than we do that. But within an apartment building or a house or a grocery store, we've not seen any evidence that this would be airborne or in a ventilation system. And then the question about other underlying conditions that seem to either increase your risk of having problems with or even dying from COVID. A lot of this data is still being gathered because this is so new. It looks like diabetes, significant obesity, immune compromising conditions. So things like people who are getting chemotherapy for cancer or who are on uh, immune modulating drugs for things like autoimmune diseases, maybe at somewhat higher risk. And then um, people who have lung diseases like emphysema um, and people who have heart disease do also fit in that category of people who are at higher risk. 
There's a question about whether it's more virulent in healthcare workers because of their intense exposure. And that I think is something that the jury is still out on. There were definitely a lot of healthcare worker infections at the beginning in China and in Italy. And a lot of that may have just been that it was before they knew what they were dealing with. And so people weren't necessarily wearing all the equipment we would recommend. Healthcare workers probably do get exposed more often than the average person because of who they're taking care of. But if we're all wearing the appropriate equipment, then our risk should be very low as long as we continue to take appropriate precautions. Um, there's a question about um, respiratory virus transmission, this idea of droplet versus airborne. And so basically this has to do with the size of the viral particles. So virus particles that somebody speaks or coughs or breathes out, if they're fairly big, it makes them heavy in the air, and so they drop more quickly. And this is this idea of droplet transmission, is these things that probably only make it a, roughly six feet before they fall down out of, the, out of the air. Viruses that are truly airborne move in much smaller particles that can suspend in the air for a much longer period of time. So from what we know now, COVID does not normally suspend in the air like that outside of a handful of procedures that we do in the hospital. Things like putting in and taking out breathing tubes and giving people uh, aggressive suctioning of their airway or nebulizer treatments. Those are the things we take extra precautions for in the hospital. We don't expect to really see that outside. And then we've got a question about support supply of testing supplies and test kits. So there's a couple things people mean when they talk about the test kits. Sometimes they literally mean the swab that you use to put in someone's nose. And for a while there was a question about supply of those because actually one of the biggest manufacturers of them is in Northern Italy. But at the moment we've had stable supplies. Then there are the actual kits you use to put tests on the machine and some of the chemicals that we use to run the test. And again, because there are hundreds of thousands of these tests being run across the country, we continue to watch those supplies really closely. Right now, we are okay. Um, there is a question about how long we think that the virus has been around. And I think that this particular virus we know that there was something similar detected on a surveillance of bats a couple years ago in China. In terms of how long it's been in people, the first time it really was detected was in this cluster of patients in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. And this virus has some similarities to other coronaviruses like SARS and MERS, but it's definitely a distinct virus and has some differences in how patients present. All right, everyone, do we have any more questions? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and, um, oh, let's go ahead and let's take this one last question, Dr. Sexton, do you see that? Oh yes, the best household items to use to kill the virus. So that is one of the good news parts about this is that um, almost everything you would normally use as a household cleaner has an indication that it kills coronavirus. So everything we use in the hospital normally does. And then things like Lysol and Clorox and bleach wipes all do. And on your hands, soap and water and hand sanitizer should both be effective. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up just with the diabetes question from Beth Galvin. Ah, uh, yes. Why diabetes could raise the risk of complications? I think we don't really know yet. But the suspicion would be that there are some impacts on your immune system if your blood sugar is out of control. And so this is people we're talking about usually who have diabetes that's been difficult to control or that isn't in control who seem to be at higher risk, as opposed to people who have very well controlled diabetes. But we'll continue to learn more. All right, everybody, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up with that. As you know, we will be distributing the recording of this very quickly, um, probably within the next 10 minutes.